Okay, hello everyone. It's great to be back this week again. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our presenter for today's seminar, Dr. Simon Weaver, who is a senior lecturer in media and communications in the Department of Social and Political Sciences and a member of the Center for Comedy Studies Research at Brunel University in London in the United Kingdom. Simon's research focuses on the connections between rhetoric, humor, and joking. And this has included the rhetorical nature of racial and racist humor, and more recently, the relationship between comedy, irony, and populism. So his most recent book, The Rhetoric of Brexit Humor, Comedy, Populism, and the EU Referendum, explores the role of humor and comedy in debates about Brexit and populism. And this is what Simon will be discussing with us today. Um, in his book, he argues that comedy and populism have a complex relationship that includes similar conditions of emergence, semantic structure, and rhetorical potential. And in relation to Brexit, it is argued that humor and comedy are central to the discourses of leave and remain, and that as forms of populism and anti-populism, both make use of and are attacked through comedy. The aesthetics of both comedy and populism are therefore linked in discourse. And it is argued both are formed through discourses of incongruity. So Simon, thank you so much once again for joining us today. And I'm gonna hand over to you to begin your presentation. That's, that's great, Jenna, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'll bring up my slides. And as Jenna mentioned, I'm from Brunel and I'm in the Center for Comedy Studies Research. Um, if anybody's familiar with my early work, most of that focused on humor and comedy and racism, racist humor. So that was that was the first book. And uh, that was also called The Rhetoric of, The Rhetoric of Racist Humor. So um, the argument is, is, is similar. It, it diverges a little bit. The relationship between racism and comedy is, is I think one of, of of racist humor, racist comedy offering us kind of a scaffold, a support mechanism, a, a a kind of mode of justification, and um, um, kind of a, 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 an introduction to to racism, which is which which you know kind of subverts some of the boundaries of seriousness. I think the relationship between humor and and and, and populism is is a little different, and uh, I, you know when I I set out writing the book. Um, in well, I wrote a couple of articles first on on the topic, uh, which which are part of the, part of the, the book, some of the chapters. But I, I set out with the the goal of kind of trying to understand uh, why there was such a explosion. There seemed to be an explosion of humour and comedy about Brexit um, before and after the EU referendum in 2016. Uh, that that involved television satire. TV satire, but also I think conversational humour between people. A lot of this is anecdotal. I don't I don't count jokes, so I didn't measure the exact number of jokes. But I did try to keep a spreadsheet at one of, at one point of instances of of Brexit humour on television, and the spreadsheet got out of hand. Basically, it was it became an impossible task because there was so much of it. I narrowed that down to specific television programmes, and even that became overwhelming. Um, Brexit formed a key component, a key content of a lot of a lot of television comedy. Um, why was that? Well, I suppose the you know the, the, you might you might sort of you might joke that Brexit has formed the content of comedy because Brexit's a bit of a joke. Uh, but I, I wanted to sort of you know think about it in in a little more depth than that. And um, it's 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 you know what I've done really is I've, I've constructed a theory of the relationship between. Uh, comedy and populism, and I, I've in the book I've highlighted I think a number of similarities, a number of similarities between the structure of comedy and the structure of populism, which I'll attempt to explain to you uh, today in in the course of of this talk. So as I, I've got a quote from the book up on the screen. I examine the phenomenon of Brexit humour to present a theory on the interconnections within comedy, irony, and populism. And I think irony is really important. Um, and I'll come to that in a moment. But in the book, in chapter two, I do talk quite a lot about the way in which um, Brexit supporting politicians who I think engage with populism also present a type of irony. And I'll, 
I'll give I'll give some examples as as we work through. Um, so they present they use irony in their political political discourse, and and they're also populists. Um, whether that's true in other contexts, I think uh, is is something that can be tested. I think in relation to Donald Trump and his brand of populism in the US, you can certainly see comic tropes around Donald Trump, comic responses to Donald, Donald Trump's satire of him, but also his, his discourse uh, layered with a, 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 a non-seriousness, sarcasm, irony, that um, maybe doesn't resonate with, with uh, doesn't appear in the discourse of less populist politicians. So those, those are some of the connections I was trying to unpack. Um, and, and I suppose the overall aim is to suggest, and lots of comedy scholars are doing this at the moment, that human comedy isn't a sideshow. It isn't an add on to the political. It's actually embedded in uh, political discourse. Um, and, you know, we need to sort of take take it seriously and, and engage with it. So um, that, that that's, that's kind of what I was thinking about in, in the text. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the interconnections between uh, comedy and populism in a moment. But um, first of all, I wanted to talk about populism and anti-populism. Um, broadly speaking, I think, you know, I use Paul Taggart's book on, on populism from 2002 for a, a, a definition, which is quite a neat definition of populism, which is on the on the left hand side there. Um, hostility to representative politics, the construction of an extreme uh, sense of crisis, the idea of an idealized heartland. So in, populism usually invokes a territory. Um, and, and most importantly, and not on the screen for some this is bizarre reason, I don't know why I didn't put it up there. It constructs a, 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 a dichotomy or an incongruity between um, the people and an elite. And often there's a leader there, there's a strong figurehead or leader who, who kind of lead the people. Um, you know, out of, out of trouble, whatever, and uh, out of the extreme crisis. So um, Brexit, you know, Brexit discourse, pro-Brexit discourse, leave discourse, matches a definition of populism. What's kind of missing is the leadership. There's, the leadership is sort of fragmented in a referendum campaign. And, um, you know, David Cameron's resignation shortly after, Theresa May never really filled that position as a leader. We had to wait until 2019 and, and Boris Johnson's victory before the populist leader sort of emerged um, as, as prime minister. So there was always that sort of, you know, it was like a, it was almost a failed populism um, in many ways, or a failing populism. They never quite got there, but eventually got there. And 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 I think that that fed that in the later part of the um, kind of uh, period after the the referendum, as Brexit was trying to be sort of sorted out. Um, whatever that means, it uh, uh, that fed the sense of crisis. Now, Remain discourse broadly fits a sort of anti-populist uh, um, um, definition. It responds to populism, responds to Brexit populism. It, it, it acts as, as a threatened kind of uh, ideology. It's the dominant threatened ideology. There is a kind of demonization or stereo stereotyping of of uh, pop, the supporters of populists of, of the people, and um, you know certainly you can clearly see a a, a turn to expertise, to, uh, expertise, um, and, and rationality in that discourse. So you've got this this kind of setup, this discursive setup, which really emerges. It emerges in the UK out of the blue. Well, not completely out of the blue. There was anti-European sentiment um, here before before the EU referendum campaign, but it's still about, I think the UK vote was around about sort of um, 15, between nine and 15 percent in, in various contexts. So it was, it was small. Um, during the referendum campaign, there was a, a, an explosion of populism. People began to think about um, um, Brexit and, uh, and populism in a way that they hadn't done before, and they expressed populism um, through, through their discourse. So that, uh, that, that, sort of, that sort of happened. But what I argue in the book is that this maps onto comedy. Uh, this maps onto comedy because this forms an incongruity. Now, um, I think it was Mary Douglas talked about incongruities, uh, sort of um, um, incongruities in social structure, that there has, there has to be a joke in the social structure for, for humor to emerge. And, and I make the argument in the book that, you know, this central incongruity 
between populism and anti-populism, between leave and remain, feeds the humorousness of uh, Brexit, populism and anti-populism. So that's the basic kind of structural starting point, which is a fairly obvious point, but uh, in, important to remember in terms of the relationship between comedy and pol politics. If you have if you have you know, stark incongruities between positions, then it's likely that comedy will play a key role um, in the discourse. Um, so we see populism emerging in the UK. Now, another connection I make in, in the book is, um, so populism has this incongruous structure, but it also has a, a number of connections with, with humour and comedy in relation to the conditions in which um, populism emerges. Now, uh, so I, I had to get to grips with the populism literature, political science populism literature, which is not something I've done before. So I was interested, interested to sort of dig down and look at the, the causes of uh, Brexit and to examine the, the emergence of Brexit and, and, and wider theories on the emergence of populism. In, in, in various contexts. And there seem to be three explanations that uh, stood out in the literature. The idea that uh, populism is, is fueled by relative inequality or decline, a sense of relative inequality or decline. The idea of populism emerging and being fueled by resentment of that uh, perception of decline. And also the idea that populism emerges in socio-political vacuums, perhaps where uh, civil society has been um, 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 has been sort of uh, 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 affected, or trade unions aren't present. There's a kind of institutional vacuum, and populism can emerge in in that type of context where other institutions don't don't perhaps allow for political activity. Now, I thought these mapped on quite nicely to um, certain styles of humour and the conditions in which we talk as humour scholars about the 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 way in which humour emerges in in uh, language and society. So the first relative inequality, um, I, I think maps nicely onto incongruity. There's an incongruity between uh, you know, per perceptions of where uh, something ought to be and where it is. Uh, resentment of that uh, perception. Um, resentment would always you know, involve some sort of construction of ridicule or superiority. To feel resentment is to, to kind of um, to en engage in a, a sort of a, an evaluation of, of structure, hierarchy, and power, um, and then and then so that sort of maps onto to humor, humor, the humor of ridicule or superiority. And then finally, we've got um, the idea of liminality and the trickster, the trickster figure in myth, you know, anthropological studies, emerging in conditions where there's a vacuum, a, a social uh, a vacuum of social structure where norms and values have been disturbed or suspended for a period. So there's a, a, a potentially a connection here um, in, 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 in the conditions, the social conditions in which both comedy and populism appear, uh, which suggests that they're connected. They're connected in terms of their, their emergence, uh, but I'm also making the argument that they're connected in terms of their structure uh, uh, as, as, as broadly kind of connected with congruity. So um, from that, um, I, I make the argument that both populism and comedy are rhetorical, they're rhetorical in nature. And I, I had to get to rhetoric as well, because that's my, my, my key interest, I suppose. They're both, they're both kind of frames, they're both rhetorical frames. They're sort of meta, meta semiotic frames. Comedy can be filled with more or less any type of content. So we can construct jokes and comedy around almost any, any type of content, discursive content or non-discursive activity. That's, that's, it's the conditions of incongruity in relation to that content that allows something to become comedy or, or, or funny. Um, populism, it's similar. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a structure, it's a frame through which, you know, we can have left, right, left populisms, right populisms, populism in, in different contexts that uh, are filled with the specifics of that situation. So it's a frame through which politics can be done, through which political actors can engage with public. So they're both for the metasemiotic frames, non-literal modes of communication. Um, and I'll explain why populism is non-literal in a moment. So that, that's that's kind of theoretical perspective that uh, I've developed. So, you know, potentially I think it's arguable that populism is 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 deeply connected with comedy and, and will will often in will often employ it in 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 uh, in kind of um, in its ideological work. Okay.
I think I've said everything that's on that slide, so let's move on. Um, so in the book, I don't, I, I, I've got two, two, um, two tropes that I pick out at one point in the book, but there are lots of tropes that are discussed, lots of aspects of rhetoric, rhetorical devices that are discussed in the, in the book. Um, but I pick out two that are particularly useful, I think, for, for the rhetoric of, of populism. And what I'll do in a moment is I'll, I'll show how those, those, those tropes and the, the concepts on this slide appear in, in comedy, appear in, appear in comedy, and, and are kind of exchanged in, in comedy and serious discourse. So, of course, populism's construct the notion of the people. It, it is a construct because it's, you know, it, it, it includes and excludes various groups. The conditions of, of membership are vague and the conditions of exclusion are also always vague. Um, and that was particularly too true of Brexit. We had the, the people, um, you know, the British people, sometimes the English people, there was that slippage between those, those types of nationalisms. And then we had the metropolitan liberal elite, the metropolitan, um, yeah, the metropolitan liberal elite, the uh, European kind of elite, uh, the European other, these 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 others were constructed in that discourse as, as being out to sort of trick, you know, trick the people, um, trick the people and maintain a, a kind of elite status in relation to the EU. Um, all of this taking place in 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 the heartland, which is of course the nation. Now um, allegory, the idea of a moral tale, uh, kind of religious moral tale, uh, religious uh, alle allegory as as a kind of quest. Um, I think we see that in, in Brexit. So a quote up from the book, we see the moral obligation of the people in populism who can usually be found to fight the corrupt elite for their specific variety of populism. as a textual practice that is mapped, placed or mapped onto the world as it is. So this is moral uh, uh, kind of uh, value in, in, in asserted in the discourse of populism. I didn't manage to turn my emails off after all. Never mind. Um, and then, and then metonym, metonym, the condensation of metonym. Um, uh, metonymic populism is a simple, uh, is a simplification coupled with a process of identification and othering. Parts become the whole in populist concepts of the people and, and the others. Because these these concepts of people and other, and even Heartlander, are are um, vague simplifications. They 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 you know they eject, they ignore complexity. They they condense um, themselves into the sort of metonymic components. So I thought those those two concepts, I don't use, I don't discuss them all the way through the book. There's a lot of preamble before I get to them, but uh, I thought they were quite useful for thinking about the kind of the rhetoric of populism uh, and some of the dominant tropes in that. But this this maps on directly to to comedy. And one thing I thought uh, I, I found in uh, in, in the Brexit discourse was the, the, the interplay between comedy and serious discussion. Some of the discussion I'm labelling serious maybe isn't that serious. And a lot of this was focused around um, social class, the construction of social class. In the early days of, of, of the Brexit period, just you know, after the referendum, it was asserted that um, Brexit was a working class revolt um, um, and a northern working class result. Now, the, 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 the data doesn't data we have now doesn't support that at all. Um, in fact, it, it's the opposite. It was the middle class vote. Uh, Danny Dorling, a professor at, uh, I think he's, at, he's in geography, human geographer at Oxford. Um, he said, contrary to popular belief, 52% of people who voted to leave the EU referendum, uh, leave, sorry, sorry, sorry again, 52% uh, of people who voted to leave in the EU referendum lived in the southern half of England, and 59% were in the middle classes, while the proportion of leave voters in the lowest two social economic social classes is just 24%. And in the UK, as, as, as in many countries, pe um, people with less money tend to, to vote less. Uh, that's the pattern that we have. So it was very much a middle class choice. It was a middle class decision. 52% um, of, of the, the, the voters were southerners and 59% middle class. So a middle class southern vote. Um, in, in, in mainly in constituencies which are, 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 are returned conservative MPs, the, the you know right wing, right leaning constituent, middle class constituencies. So the the idea that it was a, a northern middle class um, um, revolt was, was a, a fancy. But why why did that appear? 
it appeared because the BBC and other news outlets were very good at finding northern working class people who had things to say about Brexit and showing that on News at 10, etc. But it was also because of the nature of populism, the, the way in which the um, populism needs the working classes, it needs the people. And who, who best personifies the people than the working classes? Now, this was discussed in comedy, and I'll come to that in a moment, but I've got a chapter in the book, chapter five, where I talk about the relationship between Brexit, comedy, and social class. And the argument I, I, I present is that the, the, the working class do ideological labour for the um, before Brexit populism, that the Brexit populism really needs the working class to legitimise that notion of the people, that, that, that loose concept. Um, and that, that breaks down if, if, uh, if the working class aren't really actually that fussed about leaving the EU, that whole that kind of that populist discourse begins to fail. Um, and this politicians do this a lot. I think they invoke the people, of course. Um, I think this trust current prime minister did it in her speech. She invoked the people, and we've got now a, an anti-growth uh, um, coalition, which map onto this this liberal metropolitan league. But anyway, going back to Brexit, I'm I'm, I'm going off point. Um, going back to Brexit, and I'm I see I'm got. Only a few minutes left, and I've hardly got anywhere through my slides. So let's speed up. We see an exchange between uh, um, notions of class, notions of populism, in both comedy and serious serious discourse. Gary Bushell writes for the Daily Star, and uh, Stuart Lee, uh, well-known uh, stand-up British stand-up comedian, and his show content provider. Lee, Lee's uh, quite well-known. He's vo voted, I think, best living comedian by the Times newspaper at one point, and he mentions that a lot in his shows. Um, there's a there's an argument between the two. Bushel, a, day, a Daily Star uh, uh, and it's a tabloid newspaper commentator, he calls Lee Lardy. He says Lardy Lee describes modern Britain as a chaotic inferno of hate. The seaside town of South End, where he recorded the show, is a hive of races. He claims to be playing a character himself. That there's too much venom in his material for it to be just an act. Educated at private school. And Oxford, Lee represents a privileged worldview that sees itself as radical, but really isn't. So Lee, um, Gary Bushell in the Daily Star, in the tabloid Daily Star, the pro-Brexit, um, I think it was pro-Brexit newspaper, but certainly Gary Bushell pro-Brexit, uh, describing Lee, a, a cultural figure, a, 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 you know, a, 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 a comedian, as a part of this privileged elite, privileged elite. Lee responds to this in his comedy. The out of touch metropolitan liberal elites, they didn't see uh, that Brexit vote coming, did they? The out of touch metropolitan liberal elites. Who are the metropolitan liberal elites? Well, according to Gary Bush in the Daily Star, if you're in my audience, it's you. And never has that been less true than in here, in, sorry, than it is here tonight in South on End on Sea in a hive of racists. So you can see. Uh, Bush, uh, uh, Stuart Lee parodying the uh, the construction of uh, social class elites versus the people in in this discourse, which and of course the content provider is a is a show that specifically deals with with Brexit a good deal. This this continues in in sort of other other forms of discourse. Other there are other exchanges. We have um, James Denningpole. Uh, a, a cultural commentator writes as Spectator. Spectator is a right-leaning, a right-leaning um, uh, political magazine. Uh, so I, I said it was right-leaning once, somebody and they disputed that. But it clearly is, is right-leaning. Um, James Denningpole, he's uh, uh, pro Brexit on, on BBC, pictured with Andrew Neil on BBC Two on this week program, discussing Brexit and and, and discussing using. A zombie trope, to the, uh, you know, non-serious uh, trope from from horror to uh, describe Brexit to suggest that Brexit did, didn't need to be um, a, a, an apocalypse, a, a zombie apocalypse. That it, there could be positives. Um, in comedy, we have Philomena Kunk, uh, a, a Kunk on Britain, a a a mockumentary that examines uh, British history, but really is. Uh, kind of a, a parody of uh, a dumbed down kind of media landscape where um, Brexit is uh, an EU membership is misunderstood along with politics in general. Um, Philomena Kunk, written by Charlie Brooker, who is a fairly well-known satirist, 
in, in the UK. So Philomena Kunk is is reviewed by James Stanning Paul. Philomena Kunk is clearly a uh, Kunk of Britain is clearly a an anti Brexit uh, critique. It's it's a critique of Brexit through comedy, but it only mentions Brexit once or twice. Uh, Denning Paul reviews this this show in the serious discourse of, of review and um, suggests that uh, the joke is quite difficult to find and it's not clear why this is comedy or what the joke is. I think Denning Paul is probably employing some irony. So we see we see there you know a use of of non serious tropes, but also an exchange between the two. In, in in discourse, um, I, I better I better wind up. I don't think I've got too much to say, but I'll try and wind up in a minute. Uh, we also see a, a, an exchange between cultural figures, um, satirists, and politicians. Up on the screen, I've got an exchange that took place where the actor Danny Dyer, um, Danny Dyer, is, is a, he did a few films. He usually plays and he's uh, a kind of a, a Cockney, a Cockney sort of gangster type. Um, in his films, but he, he he's been in EastEnders, which is a very very well known uh, uh, um, soap opera, uh, BBC One soap opera, for for a number of years. Um, he appeared as a as a talking head on Good Evening Britain, which is a um, a, a, a program that uh, during the World Cup, I think, in, in or one of the football competitions in 2018, and he describes he he describes he uses a a profanity you can see up on the screen. To describe David Cameron, uh, David Cameron, um, pr principally, principally because he, uh, David Cameron, resigned shortly after the the referendum. So, um, a, a an actor from soap opera uses profanity on television show to describe David Cameron and his actions. Um, this is picked up by the satirist Cold War Steve, who uh, uses collage. And Cold War Steve, you'll see him on Twitter, produced a whole series of collages in which Danny Dyer, you can see this is Danny Dyer, I don't know if you, I've got, I can't really point to it, can I? But Danny Dyer is the guy in the leather jacket just above uh, uh, Kim Jong-un and he he, is, he he produces a whole series of, of collages in which um, Danny Dyer is hunting David Cameron and he's, you know, he's looking down at him. Often he's got a gun or he's throwing something at David Cameron. But this is also uh, discussed on Good Morning Britain, which is the um, uh, the um, um, breakfast television program on ITV, the one of the uh, channel, leading channels in the UK television channels. We have uh, leader of the Liberal Democrats, pro Remain, Vince Cable, talking about how there's some truth in 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 the comment from the East End of pub that uh, uh, Danny Dyer has, has, has identified the sentiment that the public. Um, you know, unhappy and, and perhaps need a, a second referendum. So, Cameron, um, um, Vince Cable takes this and uses it to to legitimise his kind of political request, his political view, and his request for a second referendum, which which never happened. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump through these because I think I've, I've I've got too much here. Um, but there 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 are other tropes that emerge: chaos, the chaos of Brexit and Remain discourse, the nostalgia. Of 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 um, it's on the next slide, the nostalgia of 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 uh, of pro Brexit discourse. I could talk for another fifteen minutes about these, but I won't. But uh, but overall, so I'll, I'll just summarise my argument. I don't know if I've managed to connect my theoretical points with the argument uh, well enough in 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 the explanation, but I'll I'll, I'll try and summarise that now. You know, certainly in relation to social class, which is one key example, we've got this. We've got the emergence of populism and we've got comedy emerging as a kind of connected, maybe a cousin, a meta-semiotic cousin relative, uh, perhaps. Um, the two work together. They, they, they work together. And there's probably something to write about the populist nature of, of perhaps stand-up comedy, the, you know, the role of the comedian in the audience and how that kind of you know, mirrors the, uh, the kind of the, the, the populist construction of the leader and the people. I think that's, that's something that could be, could be done. So there's this connection between the two. But we also see comedy engaged in the uh, the exchanges, the discursive exchanges around Brexit, and engaged in some of the attempts to legitimise um, aspects of populism, but also to legitimise aspects of anti-populism. So you see both forming rhetorics and and working with publics, you know, with 
with supporters of Leave or supporters of Remain in the in the pursuit of convincing communication. And I think I'll I'll stop there. Simon, thanks so much. Um, Sure, uh, I think you could have spoken for uh, many, many, many more hours <laughs> on oh, <yeah. laughs> this topic. Um, um, yeah, so I think what we what we'll do, but but thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions I want to ask you, but I think um, I will, um, and I think Jenna does too. But um, we we tend to want to allow our our audience to chat to you um, first, so that our voices are not heard. Um, all the time on the seminar. So I think what we'll do is um, ask um, Jason, um, who's got a couple of questions here, I think. Hi, Jason, good to see you. Um, yes, so um, Jason, over to you. Thanks, Andrea, and uh, thank you, Simon. I'm, no I'm actually a little embarrassed that my, my question is, is more of a branch off of my own because the way you set up your framing question about um, how we should understand the relationship and are these coming out independently because they arise from the same circumstances. I wish I had something clever to ask about that, but um, if you don't mind, the, the question that, that sprang to mind for me is I was wondering about whether responses to these kind of populist rhetorics need be serious or could also be comedic. Um, and because they kind of, you know, these things set up uh, a sort of response where the opponent is forced to be the straight man, although they don't necessarily. So I'm just going to run through the thought that was in my head um, quickly, mm. which is that kind of historically two examples that sprang to my mind of responses to right populism that were undermined successfully. Uh, the, the one is the very serious, they're both American examples, but the one is the very serious um, response to McCarthyism, which was the have you no decency and the, the sort of the strong monologuing and appeal to unity and to shared values in response. And the other one that, that sprang to mind was, and the, I love this example because I love that it, it ever happened, was the undermining of the Ku Klux Klan using the Superman uh, radio serial, um, which um, I don't know how well known this example is, but I find it fascinating that once upon a time, there was a guy who infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan as there was a real populist support growing for them. And what he did was he leaked the details of their, their secret handshakes and their silly terminology uh, to the writers of the Superman um, radio serial who then broadcast these. And by reestablishing the kind of frame for what counts as absurd, for what was silly and ridiculous, these private things, they reclaimed the ground and made it embarrassing to be associated. And the number of marches and public declarations of, of association dropped off. So it interests me that that worked the way I framed it because it was possible to assert the frame of what counted as serious and what was absurd. And I'm really not sure, my, my worry is that we live in a, a media landscape now of very polarized uh, left and right humor, uh, where everyone plays to their own audience and you can't reach for that, that commonality. And it may be that there is no, that we're reaching for pointing to the other as absurd and this counter humor rhetoric is unproductive and being a straight man might be the only response available. Yeah, no, interesting points, interesting questions. I'm not sure I've, I've got I've got the answers. I think there's probably quite a lot of work to do there. But the, certainly the examples you 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 give are, are really quite fascinating and interesting. I think you know in 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 the UK in relation to the Brexit Brexit populism, um, you know at at, at the moment the, the polls the, the polls are showing quite strongly for Keir Starmer and Labour Party and and the current Prime Minister this trust has, has done everything she can to help that. Um, and he very much is is, is a, a straight man, serious man. He, he, there were a few, you, know, you get the odd joke in his conference speech, not this year, but last year had a, had a few jokes thrown in, which were designed to ridicule his his opponents in the Labour Party on the far left. But um, you know, for the most part, he's, he's, he's quite straight and serious, and that seems that seems to be working. I think you know, but I think it seems to be working because. Of the of the you know the level of mistake and incompetence that uh, is is you know first Brexit and the pandemic and now 
you know, just just own goals in relation to bad economic decisions and that sort of thing. But so that 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 seems to be working in that context. In relation to Brexit humor, I'm not I'm not convinced that any of the Brexit humor really did anything to change anybody's mind on in relation to Brexit. So I think you know, though, um, I, 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 yeah, I I I'd probably you know without doing any 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 audience research or anything like that, you know, if I'm, I'm just guessing. I'd, I'd suggest that um, you know there's a there's a reinforcing of of belief. You know, there's an entrenching and reinforcing of belief, or well, at least in the early days, I think it, it probably played a role in forming views on Brexit, uh, because of course we didn't we you know before the referendum was caused, none of us had particularly strong views about EU membership apart from that that you know nine to fifteen percent that, that voted for UKIP or or other sort of far right parties. So. Um, a kind of forming and entrenching perhaps in the early days and then reinforcing after that as, as the, the populist sort of discourse really takes over and consumes consumes everything. But I mean, most of the, the, the research on disparagement humour, the psychological studies that do, do sort of experiment-based work, I did read quite a lot of that for previous stuff, especially in relation to sexism and racism and humour. Uh, but I also looked at the political studies work, the experiments that have been done by psychologists any US academics mainly um, on on political attitudes and humor and, and and I think there's some some evidence that uh, right 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 leaning comedy has, has has got a tendency to go wrong and, and can, can you know can sort of you know um, but yeah there is there is some evidence there that there is some evidence that um, you know in the intent, the intention of the comedy can can be divert, you know, can be diverted and be diverted by audiences, and it can it can produce different different meanings. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure I've answered your question, but uh, I, I think with Brexit, certainly an entrenchment. And um, but can comedy can comedy, you know, you gave the example of Superman. Can comedy sort of shift shift frames? I think it it it, it can. But again, the skill of the rhetoric, the skill of the rhetor and the and the rhetorician. Um, it's, it's probably key, I think, in 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 this. Yeah. No, no, that that does that, that's very interesting. I think there's more to do. There's more to do um, on that on the impact. I think. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, thanks, Jason. Um, Gary, um, could we get to see you and you can chat about your question? Yeah. Hi, Andrea and uh, Simon. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, I was just wondering, uh, in terms of as a feedback mechanism, whether whether humor acted as a sort of uh, moderating feedback uh, that allowed people to to engage with this with this. Uh, I mean, it was a massive change to your status quo to leave uh, leave the EU, and whether it it allowed people uh, the, the sort of reduce the shock value of that by 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 a kind of uh, I don't know, reducing uh, reducing the the scale of the change. I don't, I don't know if that's that's clear. Yeah. So of, um, yeah, broadly speaking, I think from from certainly the anti-populist perspective and the Remain res perspective perspective, I think that's that's probably the case that there's the the notion that it's a coping mechanism um, is is clearly there. You can. You can see that in the themes that are discussed in the comedy and the satire. You know, the, the idea of the apocalypse appears quite often. Uh, Mad Max and one of our one of the conservative politicians, David Davis, who was Brexit minister for a short period, he he he, he asserted that that leave the EU wouldn't wouldn't lead lead the UK to to descend into a Mad Max style um, dystopia, and that's picked up by a lot of people um so the idea of the apocalypse is there and that's that's kind of that's satirized in comedies i think there is the notion of a, of a, a sort of coping mechanism but also coping with the rationality of, of leave uh the the kind of discourse of leave and, and that nostalgia that i didn't get time to talk about i think one of one of the one of the um one of the things that i probably would would point out i think is the that i didn't get time to do in the talk was the presence of humor tropes in the in the in the discourse of of Brexit support in politicians, so Nigel Farage, Michael Gove, two key examples I talk about in the book. Gove was the uh, the conservative politician who said that um, the, the people that had had enough of experts, experts from organisations, 
organizations with acronyms telling them what to to think and get next something like that you know the, the idea of, of the anti-expertise and of course you know there's no there's no there's no there's no possible way that he could have literally meant that that's that's irony it's a, it's a, he's expressing a, a populist sentiment he's being ironic we ha we haven't we haven't literally had enough of experts he uh, he was talking about economists really uh, but even then he, he wasn't talking about any serious position he was being he was being ironic in a in a, in a broad sense um and and farage is you know he farage nigel farage who was running a parallel brexit campaign was using a lot of uh, a kind of you know the, some of the posters were clearly racist and his defenses of those posters are talked about in the book have got a kind of ambiguity liquidity to them where um he 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 won't talk literally about the poster and the meaning and the content of the poster he uses he uses various tropes to sort of um you know side set dis discussing the racism in his campaign so there's i think you know there 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 are uses of humor tropes by the brexit Brexit supporting politicians that are seeking to legitimize um, Brexit to, to you know le legitimize and to naturalize that ideological naturalization of, of that populism um, and then perhaps from Remain you know we're, we're talking more about coping we're talking about ridicule of, of, of perceived irrationalities of perceived insanity um, on, on, on the other side so yeah I think that there are different uses and there are very few we have we have very few kind of pro Brexit comedians, um, pro Brexit comedians, mainly because British comedy is 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 pretty left leaning, has been since probably since the nineteen seventies I'd say, um, but the of the handful of pro Brexit comedians, I, it, Jeff Norcott is one example. Jeff Norcott probably the the most well known. Most of his jokes were kind of picking out the hyperboles and the exaggerations of Remain. So again, it, there was there was ridicule. Um, and, and sort of not 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 coping because they were they were the victors, um, but ridicule and legitimization of, of arguments through 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 jokes. I think, yeah. So a mix of things, I think, but certainly certainly coping is is in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks Thank very much. Um, uh, Abigail has her hand up, so I think we'll ask Abigail to to ask a question, and then we'll go on to Mark after that. All right. Hi, Abigail. My camera seems quite blue. <laughs> I don't know what I've done. Um, it's okay. We can hear you well. Okay. Um, thank you, Simon. That was really okay. interesting and so um, great to have so much uh, theoretical backing um, in your analysis. Um, I'm a performer and I have a performance background. So getting your sort of uh, a theoretical framing is really interesting. I thought your point now that you just made about um, very few pro Brexit British um, comedians was also really interesting in contrasting style choices that even the pro Brexit comedian has to be very uh, tactical in their technique choices of how they still play that art um, in rather playing to ridicule mm -hmm. and victimization as opposed to the um, anti-Brexit performers. Um, but the question I wanted to say to you was perhaps what is it, what does humor tell us about what it means to be human? Because there seems to be an underlying kind of polarization and binary state that is created through humor across people groups and spaces and contextual times and there's a, a linking and a thread that I can see in how you speak about your context and your um, specific political framing there are so many mirrorings to us here in South Africa and I can place it in other countries too and for me there's a broader sort of idea around how humans cope in certain times um, in very heightened tense, tense states of great yeah. flux. Um, and Brexit was this very, just as COVID is this moment, very transitionary time. Um, just really from your kind of anecdotal reflections as Simon what do you see um, as what it means to be human from the study of 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 humor in politics and populism yeah okay that's a that's a that's a an interesting question a big question what does it mean to be human 
Um, I, 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 I'm kind of, I'm, I'm thinking maybe I, I want to say something about the previous work on on racism and you know the uh, the in terms of you know what I, the argument I made about racism it was about you know, um, ideological dis, you know ide, ideological racism is something that tries to assert truth claims that create stable hierarchies which are, are constantly being kind of attacked by the real world by experience by ambiguity so it's the relationship between the assertion of, of truth within racist discourse and and the ambiguous social world that, that, that sort of seeks to undermine that I, I i think we're you know in terms of the human condition i think we're deeply ambiguous creatures um i certainly am um so this is this is anecdotal i think we we, we are incredibly ambiguous and and uh, uh and and you know um unstable creatures really um and and I, I suppose if i was to draw on any any theoretical perspective i might i might uh to think about you know lacan and and uh you know those those uh psychoanalytic theories of our of our kind of our learning of language and the and the and the the, the troubles that language brings us you know with its with its concepts and fixities and which again don't don't match the the ambiguities and and uh, incongruities of the world, but also ourselves as as embodied as embodied individuals. And so, um, I think you know both both probably both books probably um, point to a discussion of ambiguity, a discussion of uncertainty, and mm -hmm. a negotiation of uncertainty through 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 humour. I think that's probably if I had to connect the two and think about the human condition, that would be what. I'd say we do with humor. We negotiate the uncertainty of of existence, maybe. Um, okay, <laughs> is that is that that's I can't I can't I can't prove it with a graph or anything like that, but uh, that that would certainly be, yeah, that would certainly be what how I connect to that. So the existential sense. existential anxiety, maybe. Mm. Um, there is quite a nice literature on that uh, political anxieties uh, that's that's developing. Um, yeah. Thanks, Thanks Anna. Anna. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> how, <laughs> um, yeah, Abigail, actually, I must admit, touched on exactly the, the, the thread that I was kind of had in my own mind um, okay. um, about the um, polarization and the ambiguity. So thank you for um, um, chatting about that. That's um, answered a couple of questions in my mind. Um, Mark, nice to see you here. Um, would you like to put on your video and um, chat yes, to? Yes, there we go. <laughs> hi. Good morning, uh, Simon. Uh, hi, hi, Andrea. Uh, thank you for for your presentation. I I enjoyed it. Uh, just brings a uh, new perspective on our own context because I mean we are also fa facing challenges every day, and there's a lot of challenges and polarizations. And I actually just wanted to link to that. Um, I, I guess Brexit uh, did result in a sort of a polarization of the British uh, society. Um, and I think it, 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 it also created sort of a tension socioeconomically uh, and, and sort of a, a, a separation from uh, the forces of globalization, et cetera, for good or worse. <laughs> And I, I, I just wanted to know in terms of that, um, if you think of uh, relief theory, um, and, and now I'm thinking more in the line of a Freudian understanding that there are pent up emotions, pent up ideas, subconsciously embedded in people, and all of this polarization um, and, and all of the fears, because, because I guess economically there, there, there were a lot of fears because I mean, London is the hub of the banking system of the world. Mm. And, um, uh, what role did relief theory play in in the humor and the comedy in Britain just to sort of give a, uh, a release of all these subconscious and pent up fears and and, and, and emotions could yeah, just comment yeah. on, on, on that thank you yeah there's um so I, I'd say you know I think you know the the, the comedy of, of the brexit period brexit jokes just stopped they just stopped. We had um, so again. It's psychological, isn't it? The the, the tension is psychological because uh, our economy has been affected by Brexit. It's been it's you know it's affected GDP. It's had a negative effect on GDP. 
that's 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 provable that's a fact um you know that's there for people to accept or, or deny but the the humor itself it i because i i was I, at one point i was collecting um satirical cartoons from newspapers and um they it stopped with covid actually it stopped with covid um and then and then the, the humor was about covid the, the cartoons started to feature covid or images of death etc um and so that was you know that was quite close also to what we called brexit day uh which was i think the end of january, january. uh 20 was it 2020 early 2020 covid emerged it was wasn't it yeah where are we now 2022 um almost the, the two almost coincided the emergence of covid in the uk and brexit day were were just a few weeks apart uh which was uh, which was a, a, a strange irony really so one crisis was replaced with another and and really media content turned to covid brexit was forgotten about during the pandemic almost it was it was mentioned very little in news media in mainstream news media so um certainly i think the coping the coping is 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 there it's it's there and it's 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 often the sense of need the, you know the, the urge to the urge to cope or the or the feeling of needing to cope through humor or to consume humor of a particular type i think probably probably is manufactured not not by the the economic or political conditions themselves but by the the the, the circulation of discourse i think so you know the fact that the economy is 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 weak now because of Brexit does not mean that we need to joke about Brexit. Uh, we're not doing that. So it's it's the circulation of discourse and 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 potentially the whipping up of that discourse by 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 political actors, by media media commentators. You know, the whipping up of populism, which feeds feeds the need to cope. So um, I don't. Uh, it, certainly, it's there. And I think in terms of the styles, you know, most of the comedy is 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 perhaps. It's not necessarily it's not necessarily punching down. It's not it's not uh, ridiculing Brexit supporters, leave voters that much. Um, most of it's focused on politicians, or it's focused on the absurdity of of, of the positions asserted by politicians. So it's 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 um, it's satire. I'd say it's satire rather than kind of you know ridicule of the masses or anything like that. But um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question there. Sorry. Um, Sorry, yeah, I, I, I didn't get the last part. <laughs> I, I I wasn't sure if I completely addressed your question. Yeah, yeah, no. I, like in South Africa, we we make jokes about everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a way to, to to cope through through the realities of, of of life. And and I just wanted to know if if there are similar things happening, but it seems it's it's uh, less pronounced uh, in in terms of the economic uh, and and knowledge. Uh, yeah. With, with, with Brexit, as if it, it, it's a serious issue to joke about it would not be appropriate. I, I, I think it, it's just no longer funny anymore. I think it's happened yeah. and people want to joke about something else. They want to cope with something else yeah. at the moment. What are we coping? At the moment, we're coping with mortgage interest rates. Yeah. Uh, so that's, well, you know, if you turn on the, the sort of the chat show comedy on Friday night, Saturday night, this, this weekend, it, we'll be joking about we we're joking about the interest rates and the and um, the value of the pound, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, 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 I think you know the, the this, yeah kind of constant sort of uh, uh, j j jumping from the and Brexit was a current the current issue for so long. I think mean, that was why they in part why there was the production so much there. But uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we have a, a minute or two just for a, a quick one last question. And um, I'm going to actually give the floor to Jenna to um, ask her question. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Simon, as well. Um, I was privy to actually at least read one of the chapters from your book, and I so enjoyed it. And of course, I, I read your first book as well, and that was fantastic. Um, so I'm glad to have the opportunity to ask you a question. Um, it's just a quick question. You mentioned the importance of irony when it comes to both populism and comedy. And um, so I'd just like you to expand on that because I was wondering if you were speaking about 
um, like cynical irony and politics in particular, because we can notice like, you know, these um, comical politicians or political comedians, I, I, I actually can't keep track anymore. Because if you think of like Trump or Boris Johnson or Zelensky, um, there's so many politicians that have become like our clowns, to be honest, and, and comedians that have gone into politics. So I'm wondering when you speak about irony, or is it like a particular reference to cynical irony? And if so, can you just expand on that very briefly for me, please? Yeah, I do. I do talk about it in chapter two. Um, so uh, Kia Milburn's written a, an interesting article on um, co comedians doing politics, comedians becoming politicians, which I draw on quite heavily. Um, that work draws on Zizek. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but Zizek, uh, uh, the uh, the political political philosopher um, who introduced that concept of cynical irony in the in the in the 1980 late 80s wasn't it I think cynical irony cynical irony that's that's kind of you 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 accept you know the system's wrong but you accept it anyway and you enjoy you, you enjoy consumption but you you know you've got this cynical ability to be critical that you're not really mobilizing and that 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 feeds into like what what people describe as the sort of post-political period don't they where as, which is kind of marked by sort of disengagement, perhaps, and and I think the the literature tends to see the emerging right populisms of the of the, the previous sort of decade or so as a, a a change, a shift from that sort of that uh, post political period. Um, what 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 I sort of I add add a little bit to Milburn and uh, Milburn's talking about comedians having a particular skill set which allows them to negotiate irony. Um, now, I, I I sort of accept that, but we don't see we don't see that many comedians being that central, being sort of central to the pro Brexit discourse. But we do see we do see irony, or at least uh, a, a, an ambiguous relationship with the truth. Um, as a, a, a component of that discourse, and I mentioned Michael Gove and, and Nigel Farage earlier on as kind of examples of that. So, you know, the argument that I try to build on Milburn, the argument I try to make is that at this particular moment, we've got all of this cynical irony. This is like a discursive resource, and that populism is able to sort of consume that, consume that, and transform that into, into um, you know, a, a kind of an anti-elite. You're cynical because of the elite, and and it, it becomes an active populist force that is is you know um which you know so it becomes the fuel it becomes part of the fuel in in which in which populism emerges um and that cynicism that that irony is is then you know um ex it's expressed but there's an acceptance of irony within the discourse audiences are, are sort of able to accept the irony perhaps and i don't know if i say this directly in the book but because they've been they've been ironic about things for so long that the you know that 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 um, that kind of flexible relationship with truth is 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 not necessarily something that's sort of critically engaged with. Um, I don't I don't kind of I describe. I'm looking at the book now. I don't describe it completely like that in chapter two. Uh, but that's that's the broad yeah that's the broad argument that 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 period sets up a kind of uh, a, a, a you know a, um, a, a sort of um, some you know a, a, a a surface that's able to sort of ignite or form the foundations of of populism. Yeah. Okay. Did that sort of answer your question? It did, and I agree one hundred percent. Okay. Oh, good. Good. Because that was one of the you know that was um it was a little bit of a struggle to think through, and I wasn't <laughs> quite sure if uh, <laughs> if it worked or not. But I'm glad you glad you appreciated that bit. But certainly, yeah, you can yeah. see um. You know, it seems it seems to follow that uh, you know those conditions would would lead to one, one another. But um, and I suppose you, that that you know that's an argument that perhaps I need to try and apply to the US to or to other contexts. But certainly, I think you can see a similar type of emergence around Trump. Okay. Oh, oh it's gone. So much time. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're out of time. <laughs> we're out of time. Yeah, um, okay. we are. It goes so quickly. Um, but so I want to.
Thank you very, very much for a, a wonderful, very um, exciting presentation and very interesting um, discussions and lots of um, uh, stuff that we'll have to think about. Um, as always, it will be, um, it is recorded and we will put it on YouTube so that we can go back to it and <laughs> gather up some of the stuff that we maybe missed along the line. But thank you very, very much for joining us. It was um, wonderful to have you here. And um, Jenna, last word. Yes, thanks so much, Simon. I know you're very busy and I contacted you quite last minute. So thanks so much for making time in your very busy schedule um, to speak about your book. It's it's fantastic. Um, it was a lovely presentation. And um, I do hope that you might be able to attend our conference next year or participate, even if it's online. But we will definitely keep you posted. So thank you so much. No, thanks for inviting me. It's been a great way to start the day. Um, so that's, that's good. Yeah, thanks, great. everybody. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a great weekend, everybody. And we will see you hopefully not next week, but the week after for our final seminar, which is um, Massey Zekafat, who will be talking to us on um, satiric and humorous messaging um, in and um, in relation to environmental advocacy, which will be very interesting. So hopefully see you all uh, in two weeks time. Okay. Have Thanks a great everyone. weekend. Bye-bye.